Hey everyone, Brian here. It has been a while, but I'm happy to let you know that I've finally completed another chapter of my book on the fundamentals of control theory, and it is available to download from my site on Patreon. Details on getting it are below in the description and at the end of this video if you want to stick around for that. But for now, I'd like to walk through the new chapter to give you an overview of how it's set up and what you can expect from the book. That way there's no surprises. And if you never actually get the book, hopefully you can still learn something from this video. This new chapter is on block diagrams. The outline of what I'll go over is a brief defense of why learning block diagrams is worthwhile and how they help us tackle control system problems. We'll talk a bit about some of the terms that I'll use throughout the book, explain block diagram algebra and how we use it to simplify our systems, and finally describe how block diagrams are used extensively in modern engineering projects with the model-based design approach. Block diagrams are very simple to draw, and they are excellent at communicating how systems are connected and how signals flow between those systems. When you first learn about block diagrams, you typically use them to sketch complex architectures, or you know, some kind of a control system or another, and then you use some rules to simplify those sketches and distill them down to get a single transfer function. And the majority of this chapter teaches you how to do that exact thing. But speaking from professional experience, you probably will very rarely have to determine the overall system transfer function from a block diagram. It will happen occasionally, but probably not as often as you would assume based on how much effort goes into learning block diagram rules. But don't let that discourage you from learning this material. Understanding block diagrams and the rules associated with manipulating them will absolutely help you visualize and learn more complex control theory concepts later on. Plus, arguably a better reason to get comfortable with block diagrams is that they are useful well beyond control theory. Specifically, understanding block diagrams will introduce you to the way most model-based design tools describe dynamical systems. We'll get into that in a bit, but first let's define some terms. Keep in mind as I go through this that these are the terms that I prefer to use. Other authors, lecturers, and coworkers might use different terms that mean the same thing. When you're working with other people, the important thing is that you are using the same terms so that there is no miscommunication. So with that out of the way, the first thing you'll notice with a block diagram is that it consists of blocks, which represent systems, and arrows, which represent signals. You can string two blocks together in this manner, where the output of the first block is the input to the second block. Blocks in series like this are called cascaded blocks because of the way the signals progress from one block to another. It's similar to water cascading from one rock to another in a small waterfall. We can cascade any number of blocks in a row, but this would make for a very boring block diagram because we can't represent feedback with just blocks and arrows. We also need summing junctions and takeoff points. A summing junction is drawn as a circle, sometimes with an X in it, and it allows two or more signals to be summed or subtracted from each other. Here I'd like to take a minute to preach about clarity in your diagrams. Now there are several ways to draw a summing junction, and they're all correct. You can choose whichever way makes the most sense to you. However, other engineers are going to read and interpret your diagrams, so as the designer, you should make them as easy to understand as possible. And for me, that just means leaving out the X and splitting a summing junction with a lot of inputs into multiple summing junctions. I'd recommend thinking about how you like to see things when you create your own block diagrams. Now, a takeoff point is when an arrow starts at another arrow rather than a block. This duplicates the signal without changing it and allows the same signal to go to different blocks in your diagram. By using blocks, arrows, summing junctions, and takeoff points, you can create complex diagrams. So let's move on to describing some of the patterns that emerge with just these four symbols. To describe these patterns, it makes sense to define a node. Arrows are not the same as nodes. A node represents a system variable, which can consist of multiple arrows if it goes through a takeoff point. In this diagram, you can see that there are five arrows, but only four nodes, because both arrows on the right side are the exact same signal. Now, if you place your finger or pin on any node that you choose, then follow the arrows and stop on any other node, you've just traced a path. Some paths have names. If you start at the input node and trace to the output node without touching the same node twice, this is the forward path, and I show two examples in this one diagram. Now, a parallel path is when two paths have the same starting node and the same ending node, but they don't share any of the same blocks. A loop is when a path starts and ends at the same node without touching any other node more than once. 
In complex diagrams, these loops can route through many blocks and summing junctions, and they're not always obvious. When you have more than one loop in a diagram, they are further defined as cascaded loops, which is one inside the other, non-touching loops, which obviously they don't touch each other, and interlocked loops. They share a few nodes and blocks, but not all of them. Now with the nomenclature behind us, we can talk about block diagram algebra. Honestly, it's pretty great that we can use algebra to manipulate block diagrams, but it's not by accident. We have restricted our block diagrams to consist of linear time invariant systems only. Also for simplicity, we represent our systems in the S domain as transfer functions. These two conditions make our algebra possible. Now LTI systems are necessary because those blocks can be moved around without changing the output of the overall system. For example, we can swap the order of two LTI systems, f of t and g of t, and the output y of t won't change. I go through a simple proof of this statement by comparing the convolution integral between f convolved with g and g convolved with f. Spoiler alert, the results are the same. I show with an example how even simply swapping the order of two blocks produces different values if the systems are not LTI. So if we only need LTI systems, then why work with transfer functions at all? Well, that's because the math is way easier. We take the math-intensive time domain operations like convolution, differentiation, integration, and time shifting, and turn them into operations that only need addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So with that in mind, I list out a few of the more popular algebraic rules for block diagram manipulation. I cover combining two blocks in series into a single block, moving a summing junction to before or after a block, also moving a takeoff point to before or after a block, removing a forward parallel path, and removing a feedback path. Now, removing a feedback path is done all the time, so it's worth memorizing, or at the very least, learn how to solve for it, which I think is pretty simple. I find an easy way to solve for it is to label the node before the block g of s. I call it e of s since it's the error signal. Then set up the two algebraic equations for this diagram, and then combine them into a single equation and solve for y of s over u of s, which is the transfer function. What's really cool about this algebra way of manipulating diagrams is that you can apply it to different situations. Here we take a single transfer function and use algebra to create an equivalent system with unity feedback. Now I don't walk through exactly how to do that here because it's one of the practice problems later on. At this point we can now use our algebra rules to simplify block diagrams to find the system transfer function. In this first example I combine systems B and C which are cascaded. Then I remove the negative feedback path and end with another set of systems in series that we can combine. Something to keep in mind is that it doesn't matter the order you take to simplify diagrams. As long as you adhere to basic algebra and don't make any mistakes, you're going to get the right answer at the end. I walk through that first problem again, but this time I start by moving the summing junction to before system A first, but I still get the same answer at the end of the problem. This is important to realize because if you find yourself not sure on where to start, you could actually just start anywhere and still get the right answer in the end. The next example walks through a more complex example with interlocked loops, followed by an example of a poorly drawn diagram. Now I want to harp on this one one more time because you can draw a diagram that is technically correct, but really hard to read and understand. In this drawing, you can't easily tell how many feedback loops there are or what the feed forward path is. By simply rearranging the blocks and arrows, you can make this much simpler to read. From here, we can easily find our system transfer function using our algebra rules. Now in this final example, we go from a system with non-unity feedback, which is a system with a block in the feedback path, to a system with unity feedback. This comes in handy when you need to convert to unity feedback before you can take advantage of some control theory tools like root locus and the steady state error calculation using the final value theorem. The last section is a brief introduction to model-based design and how we use block diagrams to help large-scale engineering projects save money and time during the design and test phase. This section is a bit wordy, but I think it's worth a read because if you are in or thinking about getting into the automotive or aerospace industry, then you will absolutely be exposed to model-based design approaches. 
and model-based design tools like Simulink from MathWorks and LabVIEW from National Instruments use block diagrams as the interface to how you describe your dynamical system. Understanding and working with block diagrams will go a long way to getting you comfortable working with model-based design tools in the future. At the end of the chapter, I list a few example problems where you can practice what you've just learned. Now overall, that's the gist of this update on block diagrams. Now I'm the only person who sees the new updates before I release them, so chances are there are some typos and confusing statements and maybe even some missing content. If you find anything that you think should be changed about this book, I would love it if you provided that feedback to me. Appendix A describes how to go about doing this. And if I use your suggestion, then if you want, I'll add your name to the list of people who have helped make this book awesome. I want to express a heartfelt thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. Writing this book takes a lot of work, and what keeps me motivated is hearing your comments on the book, interacting with my readers, and generally knowing that people support and find useful what I'm doing. I want to specifically thank my $5 and $10 level supporters. I don't give you guys really anything special for contributing so much, so it means a lot to me that you have committed that much to my work. If you're watching this and would like to support me, or just go and get the book, you can do so for as little as a dollar at the link on the screen and in the description below. If you really want the book, but absolutely don't want to give me anything for it, I've released it under a Creative Commons license, so you're welcome to get the PDF from one of your friends or colleagues for free. If you want to be really sneaky about it, you can donate on Patreon, get the book, and then pull your donation back. However, it's simpler, and I'd prefer it if you just message me directly and I'll just send you a copy for free. Thanks everyone for the continued support, and I hope this chapter helps you on your quest to become a better control system engineer. Cheers.